Welcome to Mr. Van Lowe's poorly monetized low budget science channel. Do not click like, do not click subscribe. Today we're going to talk about topic 5.2 involving the heating effects of electric currents. Our learning objectives. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to use particle theory to explain how conductors acquire thermal energy from electrical current. Nice. You will be able to describe Ohm's law, very important stuff for electricity. You will also be able to identify ohmic and non-ohmic conductors through consideration of the characteristic voltage versus current graph. Finally, you will be able to solve problems involving potential difference, current, charge, Kirchhoff's circuit laws, power, resistance, and resistivity. And some of that stuff will occur via handout and not directly in this lecture. Okay, so let us talk about resistance and Ohm's law. So uh, resistance is a function of the potential difference across a circuit component divided by the current flowing through it. So the more easily current flows through an object, the lower its resistance must be. Uh, and the opposite is also true. So current and resistance are inversely proportionate. And that will make sense when we look at Ohm's law because it is given by uh, this. Resistance is equal to potential difference divided by current. And in the data book, you will find this. R is equal to V divided by I. Okay, so there it is. Uh, v is for voltage or potential difference. If we want to be picky about it, and we do. Uh, and I is obviously for current. Okay, I personally prefer V is equal to IR. It reminds me of the word virus or virulent and is therefore easy to remember. But the debate, the data book definition is more technically accurate though because resistance is a function of both voltage and current together, okay? Okay, so when a temperature of a conductor is kept constant, it resistance will stay constant. But if we change the temperature of that conductor, that's going to affect its resistance significantly. And we'll look at how and importantly, why momentarily. Big ups to Futurama. Okay, so uh, it boils down to this. Uh, our atoms have kinetic energy, and the more kinetic energy they have, the more likely they are to collide with electrons. And here we're primarily talking about uh, the atoms in a solid, which are moving back and forth. They are oscillating, or in the words of Richard Feynman, jiggling. They're just jiggling back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the more kinetic energy they have, the faster they're jiggling and the harder they're jiggling. You might recall from topic three, if they're jiggling hard enough, they will actually break out of the structure of the solid and you will have melting, okay? It can all be explained by kinetic theory of particles. Okay, so the more that these collisions with electrons occur, the more kinetic energy our atoms will gain and therefore, uh, well, hold that thought. As we discussed in topic 5.1, electrons in an electric field are accelerated in the opposite direction of the field. Okay, so these electrons are going to gain kinetic energy as they move through the lattice structure of the conductor. They're then going to inelastically collide with the atoms of the conductor and they will dump off kinetic energy. I think we've covered that. So let's break it down. Looks like this. Our particles, our atoms are jiggling and the accelerated electrons uh, collide with jiggling particles, dumping off kinetic energy. Particles of the conductor gain kinetic energy and their average velocity increases. 
which means they're jiggling harder. Following this collision and the loss of kinetic energy, the electron is re-accelerated by the electric field through the conductor, and the process repeats. Okay, so in topic three, we learned that temperature is defined by the average kinetic energy of a particle of a substance. So this harder jiggling means that we're going to see an increase in temperature. More current means more kinetic energy, which means a higher temperature. There you go, there's your relationship. And this is the way that most, most conductors under normal conditions will operate. So as you run more current through them, they get hotter. And that's, that's absolutely normal behavior for a conductor. Okay, so we're going to look now at an abnormal resistor, and that is an ohmic resistor. Um, note that resistors, again, under normal conditions, do not behave ohmically. Uh, but our ohmic resistor is characterized by a linear or proportional relationship between voltage and current. Um, we use ohmic resistors in electrical circuits or electronics uh, because we want that constant resistance. We want that predictable behavior of the resistor. Uh, but those are not usual resistors. That's an abnormal scenario. Okay, non-ohmic resistors are more typical of what happens under natural conditions. Uh, and these non-ohmic resistors have a distinctive nonlinear relationship between voltage and current. So you get this nice S curve. Okay, so looking at non-ohmic resistors in a little more detail, uh, you can see here, I've drawn this dotted line and this is a tangent line. Remember, a tangent line, uh, a line tangent to a curve, is defined by the fact that only one point on this line is touching a curve, okay? So in this case, we would be looking at a voltage of, eh, I don't know, uh, half a volt, probably. Uh, if we were talking about calculus, we would be dealing here with a derivative, but relax, there is no calculus here. You can just chill out. I think I might pause and wait for my students to leave the school because they are being loud and it's a little distracting. So uh, hold that thought. Okay, so no calculus is required here. We know the formula for slope, okay? And it is given by slope is equal to change in y divided by change in x. In this case, the value on our uh, y-axis is current and the value on our x-axis is voltage, okay? So, also recall that resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. So, if you look here, and you look here, you should be thinking to yourself, aha, but uh, maybe you're not. So, if you're not, let me be explicit. Our slope is equal to current divided by voltage, and this then is inverse resistance, okay? So slope is equal to one divided by R. Our conclusion then is that slope is inversely proportional to resistance for a voltage versus current graph, where voltage is on the x-axis and current is on the y-axis. Note that if this data is taken experimentally, this will generally be the case because current is a function of voltage and not the other way around. So voltage is always going to be our independent variable and current then will be the dependent variable which goes on the y-axis. Okay, so uh, here we've chosen a different point further along our graph where our voltage is now increased and we have our tangent line in place. And what happens here is that as voltage increases, the slope of the tangent line decreases. And again, since slope is inversely proportional to resistance, we can conclude that as voltage increases, so does the resistance of a non-ohmic resistor, or at least uh, this particular example of a non-ohmic resistor, okay? So this, uh, in this example, we'd be looking at like a wire or something similar. 
uh, perhaps a light bulb, uh, etc. Okay, here's another type of non-ohmic resistor. This non-ohmic resistor is called a diode. Okay, so diodes allow current to flow only in one direction and therefore have high resistance for negative potential difference. Uh, in this case, uh, the diode we have here um, starts, uh, starts moving current at two volts or above, but more traditionally, this would be at zero volts, and then we would see our uh, nonlinear increase in current from the diode. Okay, so you can kind of, you can adjust the parameters of the diode um, to set the voltage to where you would like. Okay, here we have another non-ohmic resistor. This is called a thermistor. Uh, a thermistor will have a decreasing resistance as its temperature increases. Okay, so there you go. Um, for all of these charts, we can analyze resistance at any given data point just by dividing voltage by current. So some factors affecting resistance are the nature of the material, the length of the wire, and the cross-sectional area of the wire. So our resistance of a, of a material, a uh, property we'll call resistivity later, uh, is generally determined experimentally. So if you're looking at a chunk of a material, you will figure out its resistance, and then we can infer uh, a few things that we'll look at momentarily. So uh, how will length and area affect resistance? And you can think about that and pause the video while I quietly hummed myself the Jeopardy thing theme song. <laughs> wow. Uh, huge cringe. All right. Um, so factors affecting resistance include uh, the fact that resistance is proportional to length. Additionally, resistance is inversely proportional to cross-sectional area. And we can put all this together, and what we'll find is that resistance is equal to resistivity uh, times length divided by area. And again, resistivity is determined experimentally. Okay, resistivity, not the same as resistance, so please don't confuse them. Uh, this is resistance, this is resistivity. So resistance, by definition, has a few more factors built into it than mere resistivity. Every conductor is going to have a different resistivity. Uh, these values will typically be given in a table or problem, or you may be asked to calculate resistivity. Uh, if you don't, if the resistivity is not given, you should assume that you need to calculate it. Or you should assume that you need to look it up on the interwebs. Uh, resistivities of various, uh, various substances are not found in the data booklet. So don't waste your time trying to memorize resistivities. This is not the sort of thing that uh, physicists waste their time with. Uh, if you use a certain resistivity enough, you will automatically memorize it. Um, normally, we look this stuff up. Okay, so I've duplicated this slide. So professional, and I'm not even editing this. I'm not doing it. Okay, let's look at power. Uh, what is power? <laughs> Uh, favorite dad joke. Anyway, moving on. Uh, power is equal to current times voltage, and this then is equal to energy divided by time. Okay, very straightforward. Our unit, a watt, is equal to one joule divided by one second. And note how much more useful this is than this. This tells us immediately that we're looking at energy per time. We're looking at a rate for power. Whereas if we just look at the watt, then our, this kind of obscures some information. So when you're looking at a unit, make sure you understand what it actually represents. 
Okay, uh, we can use Ohm's law in a little substitution to do a useful trick here. So we take power is equal to IV. Ohm's law tells us that voltage is equal to current times resistance. So we substitute here, and what we find is that power is then equal to current squared times resistance. And this is handy because now we don't need to measure the voltage if we are confident that we know the value of our resistor. Uh, or the resistance in a circuit. Okay, using the same substitution technique with current, uh, we can find this form of the equation where power is equal to uh, potential difference or voltage squared divided by resistance. Okay, so here we have all of the information we need for a number of scenarios in IB physics. Okay, here are my sources for this presentation. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, in the meantime, do not click like, do not subscribe, but do have a fantastic day.